Hey guys, this is Caspi with Tape, and today you join me for episode 2 of Project Orion, where I endeavour to kind of do Orion-y type things in the uh, spirit of NASA's upcoming Orion program. Um, the first thing we're launching today is um, in preparation for asteroid capture. Um, it's a vehicle to ca capture an asteroid, fun funnily enough, um, because that's a big part of the Orion program. I'll explain it a bit more in a bit, but this is just a fairly basic rocket using the one of the new parts, which I really like, the double engine cluster thing. Um, so I'm just going to put this in orbit and wait for an asteroid which I've, I've identified. I want to get a f not a really big one because it's just really inconvenient um, and kind of annoying, but not like a tiny one that are just like little pebbles. Um, I'm thinking I'm going to go for a class B because it's not tiny, it's registered small. And I think I've captured one of them before and it was quite a, it was a decent size. And I think more like the kind of size NASA are planning to capture in terms of asteroids, which um, they're going to be doing, as I'll explain a bit more in a second. Uh, yeah, you can just see the vehicle here. Um, and I'm just deorbiting that stage and then we can prepare this. This is just one nuclear engine, has tons of delta V, um, probably quite a bit less when I have the asteroid attached. Um, but anyway, uh, basically, uh, what NASA's planning to do is um, capture an asteroid in late. No, no, they're going to capture an asteroid in late 2019, um, and then they're going to move it into orbit around the moon, and then from there they can send um, astronauts on the Orion spacecraft to go and inspect it, because then they can learn more about asteroids, and it's a good proving ground for missions to Mars. Uh, that's one of the big things they're going for. Um, they're going to be redirecting it with solar electric propulsion, because that's the most logical thing, it's the most efficient sort of thing we have that's actually used, which provides very little thrust. Like, uh, the most powerful one ever gave about 2.5 newtons of thrust. Uh, if you don't know, solar electric propulsion is an ion drive. Um, and that's the way overpowered in Kerbal Space Program. But anyway, I'm just picking out my asteroids. I've actually already picked it out, but I completely forgot what it was, so I'm trying to kind of click through this and figure out which one's which. Um, but I think it's this one. Um, it doesn't tell me the information about it unless I view it in the tracking station. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I'll view this one in the tracking station, and then I'll see if this is the, the right asteroid. Um, I think... Uh, oh yes, signal strength B. That's the only one I could find that was signal strength B, which is a small asteroid, but not too small. Um, anyway, I'll go back to my arm um, spacecraft or the asteroid redirect mission. Um, that's what that's about. Um, yeah, uh, the, so mine's using a nuclear engine and instead of ion drives, because ion drives would be painful even with the unrealistic amount of pa um, thrust they provide in this game. It still would be rather horrible. Um, this is going to pass through the Kerbin system like that. That's going to be actually quite nice to rendezvous with. Um, when NASA captured theirs, it's going to be quite uh, quite different. Uh, they're going to go out and find one and bring it back, well, rather than kind of let it close encounter Earth, because that gives you less kind of time margins. And when you've got solar electric propulsion, which is, you know, providing about 10 newtons of thrust, you want a lot of time. Anyway, so I will just um, set an alarm, uh, because then I'm just going to give it the name and then you know, give it an alarm so that I know when it's going to encounter, so I can prepare for that. Um, I'll just put myself in the similar orbit, capture it, and then bring it into orbit. Around the moon is where I'm going to put it, hopefully. I might have to send another spacecraft to move it, but I'm hoping not. It's actually, thinking about it, not in a brilliant position. Oh, and I screwed up that alarm. I forgot to put when it, you know, when it needed to be open, so I just set an alarm for ten minutes, which kind of didn't help. Um, yeah, but anyway, I, it it's actually probably would be better to have it in a much higher orbit um, when the asteroid comes in because then it's moving slower and it might just be more convenient, more a little less delta v and such. But I'm not sure, and I've forgotten if uh, if it's above or below the moon's orbit. But I think it's fairly close to it, so that could be fine. I have enough delta v on this. Um, but yeah, there you go, asteroid in 44 days. But I have a Duna window. Uh, I have a Duna window coming up before then, so I want to send a rover. And this is my idea. It's a kind of uh, fairly simple, kind of a simple core. Um, the wheels are just powered by RTGs. I've screwed up the uh, probe on this. It's pointing the wrong way, so it's powered backwards. Um, but it's got a little bit of metal on top of it because I think a lot of people, when they build their rovers, kind of don't think about durability, and I tend not to. And I quite like putting lots of crap on it. So I put this on, and the metal above, or like the science packages, does actually help quite a lot. It does shield it, as you'll see in a bit. Um, the science packages are just aesthetic, but I thought I might as well protect them anyway because I do tend to flip my rovers, and this is quite flippable. 
as you see. I think it's probably because I'm driving it in not docking mode. And it rolls, but luckily the metal on top protects the science and the probe core. So that's useful, but now it's pretty much dead in the water, so there's no point protecting it. But still, it's a nice, it's a nice thought. Anyway, I quickly fix the probe so that it's, um, so that it doesn't invert the driving, because that's kind of annoying. And I think I'm just going to go for a little drive around the space center, well, the science center, because there's the R and D place is a really nice place to drive around. There's loads of, uh, like roads and ugh, stuff to look at and stairs and stuff. Yeah, oh, I'm really looking forward to the uh, upcoming. 2.24 update. I haven't obviously, and I've seen some videos on it. Obviously, I haven't done a video. I'm not part of the media group, but the media group in uh, Kerbal Space Program are some of the big YouTubers who do some, uh, who get early access to the um, updates. So yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen them, check them out because they do look quite cool. And 64-bit, which means I will have less crashes, maybe, or maybe more, because 64-bit's really unstable for some reason. Um, I'm surprised people haven't figured out 64-bit more yet because it's kind of like. Why would you use 32-bit? Um, but anyway, let's not get out of uh, what I was talking about. And as it flips, it kind of survives quite nicely. It bounces off the wall. Pretty durable rover. Um, I do quite like how that happened. Obviously, the Curiosity rover moves around at a much more sedate pace rather than rocketing around and rolling over. But I think that would be cooler, really. I think we need a super-fast rover on Mars that is crashed within five minutes. I think that's what we should be putting money into. But then I roll it and screw it up and break a wheel, and now it's... I'm going to have to send the Kerbals out to go and drag it back into the uh, space plane and hangar, I guess. Um, but anyway, now we have something much cooler uh, involving the rover, actually. Um, I'm just fixing the ambient light because I had it turned up too high. Uh, this is launching on a test launch vehicle, which wasn't actually meant to push things into orbit, but actually does a pretty good job. Um, it can get right up to orbital velocity, even though it's just solid rocket boosters, because... Uh, it isn't actually technically an SSTO either, but it comes pretty close. I think it would be if I'd... I think this actually could work as an SSTO, weirdly enough, with solid rocket boosters, because this is a Kerbal Space Program, so it's pretty easy to make uh, SSTOs. Um, this is only about a 10-ton payload, but I didn't want to use a proper big launch vehicle for it. I like using solid rocket boosters for my test vehicles because it feels cheaper. And especially with costs coming in 0.24, you want to be thinking about cheapness. So I've been developing reusable rockets in um, Solar Civilization, and I'm always using solid rocket boosters when I can because their solid fuel's much cheaper than liquid fuel. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be kicking ass at um, career mode when the costs come out, so before anyone else, yeah. Uh, if you are playing Krim, uh, when when you do uh, when 2.24 does come out, you might want to think about reusable rockets. Um, ooh, I can plug my videos because you know that's always good. Uh, if you're gonna make a reusable rocket, then it's obviously gonna be much cheaper. And if you watch my Solar Civilization series, then you'll know um, all about reusing rockets in a very SpaceXy style way. Um, so if you haven't seen them, go and watch them now. Do it. Do it now. Do it now. Go now. Go watch them. All of them now. Okay. Anyway, um, no, don't feel obligated to watch my videos. But if you are interested in reusable rockets, I talk about them almost all the time. Um, and in Solar Civilization, my other series um, in KSP, I um, have done some pretty impressive stuff. So if you haven't seen that, you know, check it out now. Anyway, I'll stop being weird and trying to force people towards my other videos, and I'll talk about what's going on on the screen. Um, stuff, I guess. Anyway, uh, yeah, these outer boosters are just uh, about to run out, so we're going to be switching over to the internal booster. Well, not the internal bo booster, the central booster, um, which uh, is geez, has a, will have a little bit more fuel in it, because it's a slightly bigger one with lower thrust, and it will keep me at a nice acceleration, actually. Um, I have put control fins. I've started putting control fins on my rockets now. I never used to, but I quite like them, because in atmosphere, especially with Ferrum Aerospace, it's really nice to control because it is kind of difficult getting turns right in Ferrum Aerospace because if you move too far, your rocket tears apart, which will uh, be fun when it costs stuff. And, oh, another thing about 2.24 is you can turn quick saves and quick loading off. So I'm thinking of doing a hardcore series where I have no quick saves, no quick loads, no revert to launch, no revert to. If I break something, it breaks. And I think that would be really cool. And I'd just have to, and with costs, that would be really difficult. But anyway, you can see now that um, when I ditch those fairings and push this into a highly eccentric suborbital trajectory, um, you'll see some, well, you can't see it now, you can see a map view, but atop this rocket is the rover ensconced in its landing, well, its entry equipment, which is an inflatable heat shield, which is very cool. Um, 
not quite like real inflatable heat shields, which I might explain in a second. Um, and on top of it is this kind of casing of metal, because I like doing big casings and going way over the top with aesthetics, because I'm me. Um, and then it's got some drogue shoots, uh, and actually some landing stuff. It lands in a very similar way to Curiosity. Um, but anyway, this inflatable heat shield properly inflates into its full size, whereas normal ones, uh, well, ones in real life that haven't been used yet, but are being tested, just inflate a little bit around the outside to give you a little bit of extra surface area, which is kind of useful um, for slowing down, especially for taking things to Mars, uh, because it's, you know, very thin atmosphere, like 1% of the actual atmosphere. But anyway, I better inflate this heat shield before we hit the atmosphere. It looks very small, but it will fit within a nice... Uh, fairing, and when I open it up, it gets rather, um, well, rather larger than it was before, and it'll cover up the whole rocket, and, uh, not the whole rocket, the whole rover, and it'll, um, and it also provides a loads of drag, which makes slowing down really easy, which will be very important when I get to Duna. Um, this slows down a ridiculous amount on Kerbin, because, you know, thick atmosphere, but when it gets to Duna, it will be slowing down much less, and those, um, landing rockets will be very important. It's kind of, um, designed in the sky craney type way, except, I don't have a crane. Um, I might put a Kerbal Attachment System grapple hook to hike th type thing on so that I can actually properly crane it onto the surface, but for now it's just kind of a drop crane thing. And I have got mech job on this with the Translatron because um, I don't know if you've ever tried to kind of hover with parachutes, it's pretty much impossible. But anyway, you didn't even see the burning there because this heat shield is so effective at slowing down. And um, the drogue shoots have gone, uh, three of them. Far too much for landing on Kerbin, but I thought I might as well test the entire vessel. Um, but yeah, most of the slowing down on Duna will be, well, most of it will be done by the parachutes and the, uh, um, and the heat shield, but there's still a heavy possibility I'll be traveling at, like, Mach 1, so I will need to slow down with the engines, and um, that's obviously what the engines are for, uh, to just stop me in my tracks. And then you know, yeah, and then just drop it onto the uh, drop the uh, rover onto the surface, and then hopefully it will just hover there, so I can move the rover around without having this big casing on top of it. <clears throat> and the casing is actually autonomous; um, it can fly by itself, although it has pretty much no battery life. Um, so that's that's something to take into consideration. Uh, but anyway, we're getting down pretty low now, below five kilometers. At two and a half kilometers, these uh, drogues will deploy fully and slow us down to r a ridiculous amount. Uh, we're already only falling at. 50 meters a second because of that huge heat shield. Um, yeah, that, and they, the other thing about the heat shield is it's, it's really light. It's like lighter than normal heat shields because it's inflatable. And as I drop it, you can see it kind of just falling really sedately. When it touches the ground, as you'll see in a minute, minute it doesn't even break. It just kind of touches down because it's like falling on parachutes. Um, but yeah, you can see this kind of casing and engines around the outside. You can just about see the rover there. Um, I think, yeah, you, yeah, I'm getting a pretty good quality, I'm not sure if um, YouTube will uh, compress it down too much, but I do turn the ambient light up in a bit, so uh, you'll be able to see that and everything will be fine, because I know it's really crap to watch darkened KSP videos on YouTube, um, because YouTube darkens them and stuff. Uh, but yeah, I th it should be fine. There you go, I just turned it up. Um, this is post-commentary, so I'm trying to, you know, remember everything that went on. But anyway, I uh, cut the chutes and ignite the engines, because I don't want to be using chutes and engines, that always gets really, really annoying. So I will descend at 20 meters a second until I deem um, fit to slow down to 10 meters a second, and then 1 meter a second, and then 0 meters a second, because we don't want to be falling too fast. Um, MechJab will deal with everything, like the horizontal speed, which is, you know, you want to get rid of that. Um, and I'll just punch in the number for minus 10 meters a second in a second. There we go, that was maybe a little late. Get, not, get on your game, Peter. Um, but yeah, it's quite a nice way of slowing down, it's quite controlled. Um, I mean, it does look pretty sway right now, I understand that. Oh look, there's the heat shield, just fine. Um, yeah, it doesn't look particularly controlled right now, but uh, there we go, we'll just let the rover go because we can slow down. And it doesn't matter too much if it's moving horizontally, because it's a rover, it'll just drive. But yeah, this has had a few things stripped out of it, but it will be more upgraded for the mission. And you can see the uh, the casing just hovering there in the background, still being controlled by MechJeb. Um, so yeah, I just decided to drive this around a bit, and just see what's what. And then it smashes into the floor, and we get a cool little, uh, cool little visual there. But yeah, this will hopefully land on Duna and be really cool. Um, 
I, I'm thinking of putting of getting a media fire thing so that you can download my crafts for stuff like Operation Blackhawk because they're like fighters. And I'm thinking of doing some interesting things for this, so I might include this if I get it. I don't have the media fire thing now, but eventually I'd like to ha share my crafts with you people because I'm sure some of you at least would be interested in them. Um, so yeah, um, I hope you've enjoyed this, and that's br not broken. The casing saved it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I will join you again for episode 3 of this. I hope it will be even more interesting. This has been Chaos Through the Tape. I will see you next time.